Hello and welcome to the Lansdowne Sunday Sermon for the 18th of July 2021. We are back in 1 Samuel, continuing on from last week, and we are now at chapter 13. Just to let you know that uh, if you listen online only, uh, and if you live in the vicinity of South East London, we do have face-to-face -face services in addition to these online recordings. Uh, we meet uh, each Sunday at 11 a.m. And if you live nearby and you're not already involved in a good local church, um, then why not consider paying us a visit? The address is in the the section below this video, the uh, explanation section below this video, um, and you'd be very, very welcome to come and join us in future weeks. Before we get on to today's message, let's seek the help of Almighty God. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you that we can come wherever we are to look at your word. Father, thank you that you're not restricted by time or location. And thank you, Father, that you've given us your very words. And thank you that they are translated into our own language. Father, we pray again that you'd help me with my delivery, uh, with to be clear, to share your true words from the scriptures. And Father, we pray that you would give us ears to hear and that we would hear your voice, and that you would challenge us and you would also comfort and encourage us through your word, by your Holy Spirit's power. We ask for his help and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, Please take a Bible wherever you are on your phone or uh, a paper Bible and let's listen to God's word and let's follow along if you're able um, in your own Bible so we can see that what is being said comes out of the text of sacred scripture. 1 Samuel chapter 13 and I'm reading from the English Standard Version. Saul lived for one year and then became king. And when he had reigned for two years over Israel, Saul chose 3,000 men of Israel. 2,000 were with Saul in Michmash in the, and the hill country of Bethel. And 1,000 were with Jonathan in Gibeah of Benjamin. The rest of the people he sent home, every man to his tent. Jonathan defeated the garrison of the Philistines that was at Geba. And the Philistines heard of it. And Saul blew the trumpet throughout all the land, saying, Let the Hebrews hear. And all Israel heard it said that Saul had defeated the garrison of the Philistines, and also that Israel had become a stench to the Philistines. And the people were called out to join Saul at Gilgal. And the Philistines mustered to fight with Israel, 30,000 chariots, and 6,000 horsemen and troops like the sand on the seashore in multitude. They came up and encamped in Michmash to the east of beth -Avon. When the men of Israel saw that they were in trouble, for the people were hard-pressed, the people hid themselves in caves and in holes in the rocks and in tombs and in cisterns. And some of Hebrews crossed the fords of the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. Saul was still at Gilgal, and all the people followed him, trembling. He waited seven days, the time appointed by Samuel. Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and the people were scattering from him. Praise God for his word. We'll pick up the reading uh, uh, again a little bit later. Now, Research shows that one in seven drivers would jump red lights 
or go round a barrier at a level crossing. And if you don't know what that is, that's where the uh, a rail line um, is at the level of the road and you have a level crossing. And one in seven drivers would jump the warning lights, risking their own lives and the lives of the people on the trains that run on the railway. These drivers think they know best. They assume the train won't hit them. And they think that getting to their destination is the most important thing. When we are under pressure, will we ignore the red lights of the warnings of Scripture? The warnings to obey God rather than to obey ourselves. Will we be patient and wait for his timing or will we choose what seems best to us? Scripture has several examples of people who thought that their way was better. Eve thought it would be good to be wise and she took the fruit. Abraham thought enough time had passed and so he tried to fulfill God's promise of a son his way rather than waiting on the Lord. And here in this passage, Saul, rather than obey God's command and wait for Samuel, did things his way. God's word is the final authority no matter what. God's timing is perfect, even when we think he is taking too long. We see in the passage we've read initially, the kingdom begun. Saul's reign is introduced in verse 1, but it comes across quite unusual. Saul lived for one year and then became king. And when he had reigned for two years over Israel, verse 2, Saul chose 3,000 men of Israel. There are some questions here about the original Hebrew manuscripts. Some people feel that um, the numbers have dropped out of the original manuscript. So the NIV um, says that Saul began to reign at 30 years um, and reigned for 42 years. And they draw that from uh, the Greek manuscripts uh, and also from the reference to Saul's reign in Acts 13 and verse 21. Another possibility is that Saul became king formally one year after he was anointed. And of course, we saw that, didn't we, in chapter 10 with Samuel anointing him and then Saul doing nothing. And then Samuel calling the people together um, at the end of chapter 10. Uh, and then in chapter 11, Saul fought with the Ammonites and then he was uh, formally appointed king. And then it seemed that a two year period followed that um, before uh, these events we see in chapter 13. Alternatively, some suggest a two year period is up to chapter 15 when, because of his sin, he is finally rejected as king. Now, of course, we, uh, we can't be 100% certain, but actually the important message of chapter 13 is not the exact timing of Saul's appointment and his age, it's actually what he does and what he doesn't do. Now, to understand what's going on in chapter 13, we need to turn back again to chapter 7. Now, in chapter 7, Saul is anointed. He's told, sorry, chapter 10 and verse 7. In chapter 10, Saul is told various signs will happen to him after he's anointed. And then he's told in verse 7, now, when these signs meet you, do what your hand finds to do, for God is with you. 1 Samuel 10, 8. Then go down before me to Gilgal, and behold, I am coming down to you to offer the burnt offerings and to sacrifice peace offerings. Seven days you shall wait until I come to you and show you what you shall do. Do what your hand find to do, if you remember, was the call on the, the basis of the confirming signs that he was to demonstrate 
his kingship and attack the, the Philistines near his hometown of Gibeah. He didn't do that, as we saw back in chapter 10. So God shows mercy through Samuel and calls the people together for a public recognition. That's the end of chapter 10. And then God further gives Saul opportunity to be affirmed as king through permitting the raid of the Ammonites on the eastern side of the Jordan and granting Saul a mighty victory. And then we have the renewal of the kingdom that we saw last time in chapter 12, along with Samuel's warnings. But now in chapter 13, Saul eventually is turning his mind and his desire back to Samuel's original command in from chapter 10 and verse 7, do what your hand finds to do for God is with you. Go and attack the Philistines near your hometown. He's got himself an army, verse 2, 3,000 men of Israel and his son has a thousand of them and he has 2,000 and he sent others home. Also verse 2, a bit like Gideon. So, so far, so good. But in verse 3, it's Jonathan, his son, that attacks the garrison of the Philistines. Um, but in verse 4, it says all Israel heard. It said that Saul had defeated the garrison of the Philistines. And so Saul is getting the credit for what his son does. But also in verse 4, we see that Israel had become a stench to the Philistines. The Philistines were very angry. And verse 5, the Philistines mustered to fight Israel, 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen and troops like sand on the seashore in multitude. And they came up and camped at Michmash. That's where Saul was originally. So Saul has now retreated back to Gilgal, where he was affirmed as king. But here is the opportunity for Saul to lead the people against the Philistines and to fulfill his God-given mission. In 1 Samuel 9 and verse 16, uh, God says to Samuel about Saul's initial visit. Tomorrow about this time I will send to you a man from the land of Benjamin and you shall anoint him to be prince over my people Israel. He shall save my people from the hand of the Philistines. For I've seen my people because the cry has come to me. So that is the beginning. The kingdom begun. But the kingdom is threatened. As we've mentioned in verse 5, this huge multitude at Michmash. And some 10 or so miles away in Gilgal, there is Saul. The Philistines have the high ground. But Saul is down near the Jordan Valley at the place where Joshua launched his attack against Jericho. And also, as we saw last time, where Israel was circumcised after the wilderness wanderings. But it's a place of relative safety. So there's actually no excuse for this great fear that we read about. So the passage, verse 5, again, is reminiscent of Judges chapter 7. We read there about troops like sand on the seashore, which is exactly what we see in uh, Judges 7, 12. The Midianites, the Amalekites and all the people of the east lay along the valley like locusts in abundance. And their camels were without number as sand that is on the seashore in abundance. But this is no problem to the Lord. If you look in uh, Exodus 15, 19, it says when the horses of Pharaoh with his chariots and his horsemen went into the sea, the Lord brought back the waters of the sea upon them. So chariots are no problem to the Lord. But the people had spiritual memory loss. They had forgotten who God is and what he has done. And often we suffer that same problem of spiritual memory loss and we forget 
what the Lord has done. We forget Calvary. We forget the resurrection. We forget um, what that old song says that he he rolled back the waters of the Red Sea. He is, nothing is too hard for him. He's a creator of the universe. And we forget these things under the pressure. And so the people began to flee, as we see in verse 6 of, of, of 1 Samuel 13. When the men of Israel saw they were in trouble, for the people were hard pressed, the people hid themselves in caves and holes, in rocks and tombs and cisterns. Some even went, verse 7, across the Jordan to the other side to try and get away from the threat of the Philistine. It says, Saul was still at Gilgal and all the people followed him trembling. Again, this is reminiscent of Judges 6 and 7 of Gideon. You find Gideon uh, threshing in a cave, out of the, in, in a wine press, sorry, out of the way of the Midianites because of fear. And we have the same thing happening again. The, 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 the challenge is, well, what, Saul, what do you think you're doing? What, do you, what are you doing, Saul? Uh, you're this great king now, and yet you're more fearful than Gideon, quaking with fear. But Saul had a simple task. He was told back in chapter 10 and verse 8 to wait seven days, and then Samuel would come and offer the sacrifices, the burnt offering and the peace offering, and then Samuel would tell Saul what to do. A simple command that Saul had to obey. The question is, would he obey that simple command? The question for us is, will we wait for the Lord when we are under pressure? Will we trust him and obey him or choose our own solution. Let's pick up the reading. We'll get a read again, uh, starting at verse 8, and this time down to verse 15. He waited seven days, the time appointed by Samuel. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and the people were scattering from him. So Saul said, Bring the burnt offering here to me and the peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. As soon as he had finished offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came and Saul went out to meet him and greet him. Samuel said, what have you done? And Saul said, when I saw that the people were scattering from me and that you did not come within the days appointed, and the Philistines had mustered at Michmash, I said, now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal and I have not sought the favour of the Lord. So I forced myself and offered the burnt offering. And Samuel said to Saul, you have done foolishly. You have not kept the command of the Lord your God with which he com commanded you. For then the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and the Lord has commanded him to be prince over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. And Samuel arose and went up from Gilgal. The rest of the people went up after Saul to meet the army. They went up from Gilgal to Gibeah to Benjamin, Gibeah of Benjamin. And Saul numbered the people who were present with him, about 600 men. Saul's eyes should have been on the Lord and not on the problems. Saul should also have known that the prophet of God would not lie. And so he needed to wait. But he decided that Samuel was late. But since if you look in verse 10, Samuel came as soon as he finished offering the burnt offering. That's the first offering. He was going to then offer peace offerings. That Samuel was not late. It just seems he came towards the end of the seventh day rather than at the beginning. Saul decided he would take matters into his own hands rather than obey the word of the Lord. The main issue wasn't the sacrifice, 
but the fact that God's word in chapter 10, verse 8, had said that Saul was to wait for Samuel to make the sacrifice and to tell him what to do. He chose not to wait either for the sacrifice or for the word of God. In verse 12, he claims he was seeking the favour of the Lord. And yet what he's doing here is simply repeating the, 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 the foolishness of chapter 4, when Israel lost a battle and said, oh, well, we'll just bring the ark along and God will bless us. And Saul is saying, well, if I just do the outward thing, never mind the obedience, just the outward thing, then God will bless me. But hearing and obeying the word of God is more important than any other thing. We cannot replace obedience with songs or prayers. Of course, there should be songs and prayers. They're part of obedience, but they cannot replace the inward love for God and the obedience from the heart to follow his commandments. Now, Samuel says that Saul has done foolishly. He says this in verse 13. Now, this is not foolish in the sense of stupidity, but foolish in the sense of Psalm 14 and verse 1. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. Now, wait a minute. You're, surely you're, you're not saying that Saul didn't believe in the Lord. He's sacrificing to the Lord. But he's actually behaving as if the law does not matter. He's behaving like he doesn't believe. He's filled with fear. The people are filled with fear and are deserting. He says, oh, well, the people need to be gathered together. The bat's going to begin and I need to get ready for that. He was thinking he knew better than the Lord. He broke the Lord's command. He's saying, my way is the best way. Yes, I kind of believe in God, but actually I will do as I please so that I look good and right in front of the people. So I do the, this outward form of religion without obeying God from the heart. He's behaving like an unbeliever. Disobeying the Lord is a form of atheism. That's not to say that obedience is easy, but either he's God or we are. We must obey God's word and not follow good ideas or compromise and do what we feel is best. God's word is the final authority. It ends all arguments. If the Lord has said it, we must do it. Now, unlike Gideon in Judges 7, who saw the multitude and allowed God to whittle down his army and trusted him. Saul did not trust the Lord. As we've said, he's less of a leader than Gideon. He, he was supposed to be the king to make them like the nations and he's making them less godly and effective than the time of some of the judges. But there's also here a link with Genesis chapter three. There the Lord asked Adam, where are you? He was not seeking information the Lord knew. He also asked Adam and Eve, what is this that you have done? So Samuel comes to Saul in verse 11 and says, what have you done? Samuel knew as he did later in chapter 15, but he's giving Saul the opportunity to confess his sin. But just as Adam blamed his wife and blamed God, remember the woman you gave me, she gave me the fruit, the woman you gave me, Saul also blames everyone but himself. Saul said, verse 11, the people were scattering from me. You did not come within the appointed time, although he did. He was just a bit later than Saul thought. And the Philistines had mustered at Michmash. So it's a Philistine's fault. It's Samuel's fault. It's a people's fault. He did not own his 
sin. This is something that we must do. When we confess our sin, it means we need to recognise our sin. Here are some words of an old hymn called Depth of Mercy, which have been updated with a new tune. And if you're watching this online, it's the very last song in the sung worship playlist. And verse two says this, give me grace, Lord. Let me own all the wrongs that I have done. Let me now my sins deplore. Look to you and sin no more. Do we own our sin? Do we confess to the Lord by saying, this is what I did? No excuse, just humble confession and resting on the mercy of God to us in Christ. This is true confession. And sadly, we do not see that from Saul. And so Saul, as the people last time, were faced with consequences. It says, verse 13, if you had obeyed, the Lord would have established your kingdom forever. Verse 14, but now your kingdom shall not endure. Nothing built on human wisdom will endure. Saul himself is not rejected at this stage, but this is a solemn warning. And all such challenges from God are a means of grace, as we saw last time. We have a choice to respond and obey the Lord now. Why didn't Saul get on his knees and cry out to God for mercy? No, he got acts, as we'll see in chapter 14, as if nothing happened. And then again in chapter 14, he placed himself in the position of God and commands his people to fight his enemies rather than the enemies of the Lord. And we'll look at that more next time. But notice something else that the Lord has appointed already. Verse 14, the Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and the Lord has commanded him to be prince over his people because you have not kept what God commanded you. There is a man who is coming. Saul has failed. But God's chosen king, the king that's in his own heart, his choice will not fail. We see that partly fulfilled in David and fully fulfilled in Jesus Christ. So Saul's kingdom is damaged, but prepares the way for Christ's kingdom, the kingdom of David and God's chosen son of David to come and reign and that son of David shall reign forever and ever. But finally, we see in Saul's kingdom, a kingdom without hope. Pick up again at verse 15 and then down to the end of the chapter. It says, and Samuel arose and went up from Gilgal. The rest of the people went up after Saul to meet the army, they went up from Gilgal to Gibeah of Benjamin and Saul numbered the people who were present with him, about 600 men. And Saul and Jonathan, his son, and the people who were present with them stayed in Gibeah of Benjamin, but the Philistines encamped at Michmash. And raiders came out of the camp of the Philistines in three companies. One company turned towards Ophrah, to the land of Shual, Another company turned toward Beth Horon and another company toward, turned toward the border that looks down the valley of Zeboim toward the wilderness. Now there was no blacksmith to be found throughout all the land of Israel for the Philistines said lest the Hebrews make themselves swords or spears. But every one of the Israelites went down to the Philistine to sharpen his plowshare, his mattock, his axe or his sickle. And the charge was two thirds of a shekel for the plowshares and for the mattocks and a third of a shekel for sharpening the axes and for setting the goads. So on the day of the battle, there was neither sword nor spear found in the hand of any of the people with Saul and Jonathan. But Saul and Jonathan, his son, had them. And the garrison of the Philistines went out to the pass of Michmash. A kingdom without hope. 
Verse 15, Samuel arose and went up from Gilgal. Samuel left. There were no instructions. He didn't wait to stand with Saul in the battle. He went away and took the word of God with him. There's one more word from God through Samuel in chapter 15. And then that's it. Saul wanted to be king without the word of God. And so God let him be king without his word. May we not any more neglect the word of God. What would we do if God were to take the word away from us? We will never prosper as God's people unless we are under the word. Now, the remainder of the chapter links closely to chapter 14. So I'll only touch on it now and then come back to it next week. So notice also the end of verse 15, no people. The 3,000 of verse 2 have now become 600. And that's with the call for others to join them that Saul issued once he realised the Philistines were on the attack. There were, verse 17 and 18, raiders. Three companies went out from the camp of the Philistines and there was nothing anyone could do about it. And then at the end of the chapter, that whole list of the different tools, uh, agriculture tools that, 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 that the Israelites had to take down to the Philistines and sharpen them because there was no blacksmith in Israel because the Philistines had banned them. There were no weapons and the Philistines were charging extortionate rates to sharpen the plows and so on of the people. So they were, had no means of fighting and they were also being oppressed economically, being ripped off. So they had nothing. This leads us on to chapter 14. And we'll see, even though Saul's kingdom is damaged and hopeless, because they are still God's people in chapter 15, 14, rather, God again shows them mercy. However often we fail, we don't we should not fail. We should not fall short. We should take our sins seriously as Saul should have done in chapter 13. We should rely on the word of the Lord. But even when we don't, we see the abundant grace of God. Yes, there are consequences. Consequences for which God will give grace if we will repent. But what a merciful and gracious God. God's grace is amazing. And yet Saul is given opportunity. God's grace is amazing because he grants his mercy and deliverance to Israel in chapter 14. But yet, as we conclude, we must realise this. And yet it is a solemn thing. Sin is serious. Sin is foolish. Sin is saying that we are God. So let's search our hearts Let's confess our sin. Let's own our sin. On, on this coming Sunday, there will be the, the, the Lord's Supper. So if you're watching this online, you'll have missed that. But the next opportunity, you need to wait for the Lord's Supper. Seek God. Stop the video now. Seek God and bring your sin to him and confess and ask for grace to change. Commit yourself again to God's word being your final authority, because God's word is better than compromise. Praise God that even though we have sinned, he is still patient with us, even when we are impatient with him. We see this in his eternal plan. Galatians 4.4, when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman. Romans chapter 5, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. God is patient. God works at the right time. Let's trust him for his perfect timing. 
But praise God for the man referred to in verse 14. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart because he is fulfilled fully by Jesus Christ, who is the true king who has saved us. So let's fix our eyes on him because he succeeded where Adam failed. He resisted and overcame temptation. He succeeded where Saul failed because he does all of God's commandments. So John 14 and verse 31, I do as the father commanded me. He fulfills all of God's commandments. But you know something else? He didn't just succeed where Adam failed. He didn't just succeed where Saul failed. He succeeded where we failed. He obeyed God's law perfectly. We all likely have gone astray. We have turned each one of us to his own way. But the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. This glorious saviour, the man of sorrows, familiar with suffering, suffered and died in our place for the sins that we've committed, that God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. And notice that he knew no sin. He obeyed perfectly. And yet he became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He went to the cross carrying not his sin because he was sinless he went to the cross carrying our sin suffering in our place finishing his work as a spotless savior it is finished was his cry he did it he succeeded where we failed and we continue to fail and he succeeds in establishing his kingdom forever. Isaiah 9 and verse 6, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David, and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. Brothers and sisters, yes, this is a, this is a word that challenges. Will we be like Saul and lean on our own understanding, not trust the Lord, disobey him? Place ourselves as the final authority rather than God's word. Will we be like Saul and not own our sin? Or will we run to this great saviour who succeeded where Adam and Saul and we fail? Will we come to him and confess our sin who is, to him who is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all unrighteousness? Will we trust him who's already done the greatest thing of all in dying for us and rising from the dead? He has defeated sin and death. He has done everything. And will we trust him with everything and lean not on our own understanding? If we're not yet a Christian, if you've not yet believed in him, will you come to this amazing saviour who has shown you the depth of mercy in dying for you has shown you amazing grace to find seek you out and to bring invite you to come to himself come and follow Jesus put your trust in him and Christian lean on him your great and mighty saviour grace has brought you safe thus far despite the troubles and your stumblings and fallings and grace will lead you home let's pray father we thank you for your word and the, the challenge of saul's example may we not be like him father if we are still unbelieving 
show us afresh the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us hear his voice in your word. Let us repent of our sin and trust him alone and follow him who died and rose for us. And Father, for us who are Christians, Lord, we pray for your strength, for your encouragement, for your mercy. We pray, Lord God, you'd help us to lean wholly upon you, not to trust our own way, not to be fools that say, I know better than the Lord, but to lean 100% on you. Father, have mercy upon us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for listening. The Lord bless you in abundance and help you to keep your eyes fixed on him. Amen.